So congratulations. Underplay just <laughs> premiered yesterday. What's it been like? Oh yeah, it's it's really exciting actually because um, the film was originally supposed to premiere at Tribeca, which was last April. And uh -huh. um, when that didn't happen, there was a big question mark about what was going to happen with the film, right? And I think all of us were a little bit concerned of, about, well, you know, could it premiere at a festival? Were fall festivals even going to happen? You know, but then we were so happy it ended up at Toronto, so at TIFF. And then after TIFF, though, still, what happened was when TIFF happened, it, you weren't able to stream it. So although, you know, it was, it was partially virtual, it was only able to be streamed in Canada. So I had so many people from the States and from here in the UK and wherever who were just like, oh, you know, we really want to watch it. And so, you know, but it wasn't possible. And then it, there was a bit of a question mark of like, you know, they were telling me like, we're in, you know, some really good talks about distro, but it was uncertain. So I have to say, you know, like just even two, three months ago, it, you know, there was some uncertainty around if this film was going to actually reach the audience that it should. So I'm really so happy. It's like, I'm, I'm happier now than the, I think I would have even been, if, you know, when it was supposed to come out a year ago, because when I thought it wasn't going to come out, I really felt like that would be such a shame. It's such an, a great, have you seen the film yet? Did you watch it? Or? I have. <laughs> okay, yeah. cool. Cool. I uh, just actually rewatched it this morning because I like to always make sure I'm really prepared for the interviews. Oh, sweet. So, Amazing. Right. Honestly, it came at like a perfect time for me personally. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much uh, the people at White Bear PR told you about me, but I am currently a college student studying mm -hmm. music composition. And Amazing. I have been applying for, it's that time of year where everyone's, you know, applying for internships. And this year they're a little more sparse than others. Yeah. Like this is my fourth year going through the process and I still haven't gotten an internship before. And really? pretty much none of the women in my studio have gotten an internship in the past few years. So seeing like other people, you know, kind of going through a similar mm -hmm. struggle made it feel a lot less lonely it was great to see the documentary of course internships are different than you know festivals but seeing other women in the field um you know have that same experience absolutely jumping off of that into one of the questions i had intended for our interview today as i was watching the film some of the djs and producers would say that they were composing um but lots of them did not call themselves a composer. Um, I think only Rez and uh, Wonderland uh, actually called themselves composers. Um, mm -hmm. I've noticed um, with your profile, you identify as a DJ and a composer. Why do you think that some people in the industry don't call themselves a composer as well? And why do you choose to? I think that some people who are not classically trained don't feel comfortable calling themselves a composer. And I think that within electronic music, it's the semantics more to, or to say that you're a producer. So I, th I think most people would say that, you know, they're an electronic music producer. Um, something about the word composer can be, interpreted as maybe taking yourself seriously you know like her too seriously if you will so that's all I think I think it's just a semantics thing um because within the electronic music scene most producers and like even when I'm saying producers yeah most producers don't call themselves composers I don't know it's just it's just semantics but I call myself a composer um because I'm you know produce electronic music but then I also you know I compose other kinds of music. I didn't really call myself a composer until I started writing music that was not just for four house music and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know. Does that does that answer it? Yeah, it does. Okay. It was just okay. something that I was <laughs> yeah, really sure. interested about as I was watching yeah. the movie. I was like, I would consider these women composers, but they don't really yeah. seem to consider themselves composers and I know sometimes like classical training a lot mm -hmm. of people like well there's like an elitism 
background behind it sometimes. And so I wanted yeah. to see how that compared in the industry. I don't have a ton of experience with electronic music. I wrote, a, I kind of went through a DJ phase in high school uh, okay. where I played with lots of LMMS and played at like teen parties. Okay, but that nice. was like the extent of my DJ experience and writing my okay. first electroacoustic piece now. So it was kind of interesting to hear the different kinds of terminology that were thrown around. Yeah, definitely. Gotcha. For sure. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's just that, yeah, that that scene is more casual. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's all. What was it like on this project? Um, getting to go into that more dance music genre while being a while acting in a film composer capacity did you feel that your thinking or approach to it changed as opposed to when you do other projects well for me it was you know really like my two worlds had collided in some ways so my background as an electronic music composer or producer and dj had, you know were were now the desired genre of you know film score. So for me, it was like amazing. You know, I I'm able to compose in different styles, and I've done dramas, and I've done different documentaries, and um, and I love that. I love kind of getting outside my comfort zone. But this was inside my comfort zone. So in a way, it was just like, yeah. I mean, it was it just really felt like the stars had aligned. And when I heard about the project, I was just so hopeful that I, I would get it because I do have almost 20 years of experience now in the scene and making this music. And I have a deep understanding, I guess, of the subgenres and, you know, the nuances. And, you know, it's just, you know, I've been collecting records and, you know, just really understand how the slight differences of you know, if you're using a kick drum or a snare drum or the BPM, you know, how suddenly you're in a totally different genre box and all this sort of thing. So I, I was really, really happy to, to come on board and sort of bring this knowledge that's just subconscious and just, you know, part of my, um, what can I say, a part of my vocabulary, my musical vocabulary, just understanding, you know, all this in electronic music. And then that really helped me write the score in a way that it could interweave between the different artists, you know, that have different styles and, you know, being able to, to honor their styles while creating a, a soundtrack or film score that was, you know, when I say neutral, I mean neutral in the way that it can't be pigeonholed in saying like, this is an EDM score, or this is a house music score, or this is an ambient score, you know? I wanted to just, you know, although it's fully electronic and not orchestral, there's no reason that you can't convey all the same emotions through, you know, through that medium. I was going to say, it. I was so impressed with how seamlessly you wove between all of the needle drops and the actual score <laughs> as you went through. There were times where I was like, wait, is this still the artist being mentioned's music or have we moved into the score now? Cause it yeah. was just so seamless. What was the spotting session like for that? I can hardly imagine <laughs> so many areas of music coming into play. Oh my gosh, there were, there were so many areas. And then because you know we, we knew that the festival season, South by Southwest and Tribeca and stuff, you know, we're gonna want a fine cut of the film already in you know last year in January February so I was writing music to edits that changed so that was a bit you know there were some times that I had you know written you know between two different pieces of licensed music and then that edit changed or the timing changed and I mean I definitely had a couple moments where I was like oh my god no you know I spent so much you know so much time sort of you know, working on this transition and all the transition change, but overall, maybe that was for the best because I just focused more on the feeling of the different cues. And so then if the duration changed, you know, that was when I first got started, I was more fixated on how is it gonna transition and, you know, really the technical sort of, you know, slick production between stuff. And then, 
in a way I stepped back and I was like, okay, I need to just sketch a lot of music. And so I'm gonna, you know, kind of rough sketched a lot of different parts of the film. And then when they got moved around, I, I fine tuned it. So that's just how I worked. I started on the score in December of 2019. And then we turned it in in March. And between December and March, there was at least four different cuts. So things were moving around quite a bit, yeah. How do you like to sketch? Do you like to sketch to picture or do you like to sketch away from watching the movie? I prefer to sketch to picture. And um, even if I know that a scene is gonna absolutely change, I still might even like loop a two minute section or something, you know, and turn off the dialogue, just, just to have the sort of colors and pacing and feeling and reminder of, you know, what the inspiration is. Um, so I do like to write to picture mainly. Um, however, with Underplayed, a lot of the pre-writing involved getting inside the music of the artists in the film and buying some new synthesizers that I thought were going to be helpful in terms of aesthetic and collecting different sequenced melodic synths. You know, that was one thing, you know, strategy that I thought, you know, the beats, there's going to be so many beats in the film that I wanted to have melodic arpeggiation or other pattern synths in there. So, you know, I worked on programming that sort of stuff um, in advance. But overall, I do like to write to some cut of the picture if it exists, if possible. <laughs> what artist from the film was your favorite to kind of get inside the head of as you scored their scenes? You know, I'd have to say probably Rez because I think Rez opened up the most. And, you know, I, I, overall, I, I mean, I haven't looked at the total duration that all the artists spoke in the film but you know Rez has a lot of moments where she's really opening up and sharing with us her old diary and taking us you know into the basement at her parents house where she made music and you know opening up about anxiety and because of that I really did enjoy getting into her character because you know when you first see her and you see those glasses and you just you know I just I don't know. I didn't know what to expect. And when I first heard her music, it's not that I connected with her music the most personally, but it was seeing the multi-layered person that she is. And in a way, her, her music also is so powerful in the sense that, you know, it's just like really, really well produced. And she just seems like she's hard as nails. But then, you know, she has that, that one scene where she says that every time that she plays, she thinks about the Toronto raves forum forum. And you know what people said about her and how that's still in her head. And so that sort of stuff, I did enjoy scoring her because it, she's, she's a complex character. And so I wanted to bring out the sensitive side, if you will, but definitely not harp on the sensitive side because there's a huge side of her that's so ballsy and, and um, you know, absolutely fearless, if you will. So she, you know, she, so yeah, I'd say she was a character that you know, really musically tried to get inside of and have, you know, layers, different layers of music and emo layers of emotion in the music that reflected her. I think that's so awesome. Uh, Rez um, has for a while been one of my favorite electronic composers. And sometimes when I'm getting ready for a concert or something and, you know, I got nerves going, I'll just go to her Spotify, hit shuffle and just shake it all out. It really helps me <laughs> get ready to just Aww. go out there and, you know, <laughs> embrace that ballsy side. And so it was really exciting to see her in the film. And as you said, kind of bring out that emotional side of herself, because I am somebody that also struggles with anxiety, just mm. got diagnosed a couple years ago. And it was, I didn't know all of the statistics and stuff about how especially women creatives are affected mental health wise. Just last yeah. week, I needed to take a mental health day and I felt so terrible about it. But oh. 
I was, it it made me feel (laughs) a lot better. Did you feel like you uh, were relating to these artists um, more or less when you were scoring the film? And did that affect how you wrote the music? Well, I mean, I, I did relate to a lot of it, if I'm honest. And, you know, the peak time of me DJing internationally was around 2007 to 2011. And then I moved to London in 2012 to get a master's and I per- you know, purposely pulled that back. Um, but you know, 20, 2007 to 2011, I mean, there was even less women, you know, and the women that were, um, you know, from the States, there were just so few, this is before EDM really, EDM really blew up in about 2012. So, you know, this is more like the underground and I, I, I think Nervo, I know Nervo was around and I'm sure a couple of the other artists in the film were around, but you know, I guess I just didn't really think about it that much, maybe in the same way that you were saying with internships, you know, I just sort of was like, okay, you know, I've had a lot of these experiences. Um, when I've been asked in different interviews over the years, like how it is different to be a woman, I've, I, I've never really jumped on the opportunity to, speak out about it um a lot and but I you know I, I could when I watched the film I was like wow yeah I definitely related to a lot of different things you know from mm-hmm. sound engineers not listening to you to yeah the anxiety or just the um, haters just criticizing and you know, just feeling like they're just jumping on the opportunity to criticize and um that you know it also definitely just the doubt surrounding about what work you did, which was something that Susan Rogers, Prince's engineer mentioned, you know, so that's definitely one theme. Um, but, you know, I, I just personally just keep on doing what I do. And um, with my music, it's, I think, pretty obvious because I'm the only one listed on the publishing and everything else that I, <laughs> certain point, I think people figure it out. Um, but yeah, I did relate to it and it, it, it made me want to represent them all with care and not to make them seem moany, not to make them seem like bitches, not to make them seem weak, you know, to just have, I know, and I know that it was important for Stacy as well to, you know, that, that they trusted Stacy and that she wanted to make a film that came across in a positive way and not a complaining way. And when, you know, coming in and post-production, I knew that and I did my best to, you know, achieve that vision and, you know, keep it all, no matter what was happening to just have this forward momentum of like, okay, yep, that happened, but we're rising above it kind of vibe. I really like that. Something I personally say when it comes to fighting for more representation and recognizing the struggle is we're not celebrating the struggle. We're celebrating the people that have struggled through that and are continuing to achieve. And yeah. that's something I thought the film portrayed really well, especially when you guys were balancing the idea and explaining the difference between providing equitable opportunity mm. uh, versus treating somebody's gender as a token item. Yeah. As you guys say in the movie, you want someone to be your favorite producer, not your favorite Mm -hmm. female producer. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's so true. How do you balance that line when you're speaking about representation? Um, Like balancing the line of... Between like tokenism and... uh, bringing up representation, if that's something that you choose to talk about uh, regarding your own music. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't think I really do. <laughs> I don't know, I just haven't really, <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, that's I don't a-okay. I prefer an yeah. honest answer over like yeah. trying to insert yourself yeah, into yeah. something. Yeah, okay, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I guess not, yeah, not, not especially. I mean, maybe after this film, I'll be thinking about it and talking about it more but up to this point I've just sort of been working hard and not letting you know my gender or or 
if if there were ever situations that I felt like may have been awkward, I just kind of swept them under the rug, basically. But yeah. Anyway, like I said, maybe this film was a wake up call for me and a lot of people to just, you know, realize that you're not alone and it's okay to, to um, come to terms and more than anything, um, like you're saying, just being a part of the positive change moving forward, really, and making sure that there are more opportunities for women moving forward. I agree. I think that's a great way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think so too. That's sort of been what I've thought too. It's just like when people see, it's like, like they say, actions speak louder than words. So I've thought about that. I have an all female ensemble called London Electronic Orchestra. And and we have a female sound engineer that travels with us. And so, you know, it's not in our bio that we're sending out, you know, it's not like a super huge thing that we're all female. Um, it's not the top thing in there is maybe like one line sometimes and sometimes I even leave it out because I know that when we show up and we're connecting all our own wires and we have our female sound engineer and people can see the musicianship of everyone on stage, it's like, it doesn't need to be in the bio. You can see, <laughs> you know, and, you, and, exactly. and then, yeah. So that's sort of been my way of dealing with it as well. Yeah. Exactly. You don't need to say female musician. You just need to say musician. Yeah, exactly. With this film, I love asking this question because people have such different ideas towards it. What do you think was the most difficult cue to score and why? There's one that they left out that was really hard for me, which is Allison yeah. uh, playing the piano live, like kind of like just replaying that was a replay though so I don't think that sounds uh, I would say I'm trying to think about which I'm looking I'm looking right now at the Spotify playlist mm -hmm. um the one that took a long time to get exactly right was the second to last track so the last track is her likeness which is the eight minute more techno of tempo one and the one before that's called our own voice just one minute and that's suzanne chiani speaking at the end of the film and yeah i recorded the moog synthesizer a few different times and we knew that we wanted it to be chords and but not too ambient and not too much like an obvious chord progression and wanted it to be gritty and you know so i, I use the analog moog synth and it just, it just was one of those. So it's like, it just is such an important moment because it's right after the scene where um, someone in the film says we did make ground and there's certain, there's music I have going there, but then it goes to Suzanne and it's a transition between the, make, we made a ground music and the final hurrah, you know, where the credits roll. And um, yeah, that was, that was tricky just to be honest just getting the harmony right and the chord progression right so that the mood was neutral like we've talked about but when you're you know it's because there's chords you know as a composer you, you'll know that it's like what does neutral mean when you have a chord progression i mean <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know there, there's going to be some emotion there right so yeah just getting that exactly right is i think the trickiest cue and it was so short and i I, I definitely was like, well, oh, why is this taking so long? But um, yeah, it would be that one. Nice. So you mentioned it was all electronic. Did you have any like electronic instruments like played by live performers or was it all just you and your synths? Me and my synths. Yeah. Yeah, I just, we didn't have, because of the, the timeline originally, you know, submitting the festivals and stuff, I knew there wasn't much time. And also I just, I didn't think that it really made sense. I know that, you know, there's a scene with Allison with her, you know, with the live cello and stuff. But besides that, I just didn't think that for this documentary and in, in the subject matter of electronic music, it, it called for live instruments, you know, or classical instruments. So, so yeah, it's just all electronic and I performed it all myself. I agree. That's what I initially thought when I heard it. And then you mentioned you have your electronic music ensemble. And I was like, oh, oh maybe. Mm. 
Yeah, that's classical electronic. So that's that ensembles harp, violin, cello, sometimes upright bass and more strings. Um, but yeah, this this was just me without the ensemble. That's really cool. It has been so awesome getting to talk to you. Oh, Thank you for you too, answering Isabel. questions with such eloquency. Do you have any final thoughts? Um, do you have any final thoughts? I would just say, yeah, I guess I would just say final thoughts. I hope everyone gets a chance to check out the film and that you know, after watching the film, we just commit to supporting everyone, you know, su supporting young girls in terms of their socialization and, you know, encouraging everyone, no matter their background, um, to be welcomed in to all, you know, kinds of fields from a young age, math, science, technology, and yeah, just, uh, that's all I would say. That's my final, my hope. <laughs> well awesome thank you so much for joining me today i hope you have a great rest of your night and congratulations again on the Aww. film thank you so much Steph. hi guys thank you so much for checking in to season two episode one of chatting with creators i am so grateful that kate was able to come on to the show and talk about underplayed it was awesome to have her on the show I was originally planning on uploading this for Women's History Month, but unfortunately was unable to due to complications with editors and my physical health. But this is such a great way to kick on to the season, and I can't wait for you guys to tune in tomorrow, Tuesday, for the next episode. See you soon. Bye!